Today I have the pleasure of going live with Dr. Matthew Blackwood and we're going to be talking about ADHD and its neurobiological basis. Good afternoon, Dr. Blackwood. How are you? Doing well, Catherine. How are you? So why don't you take a moment and give us an introduction about who you are and how you've gotten involved in ADHD. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Blackwood. I uh, did, uh, I'm a family doctor and I was in comprehensive family medicine, womb to tomb, uh, for about 41 years in Mission BC. Currently, I live on Bowen Island uh, doing uh, comprehensive care here and also working as part of the BC Rural Locum Service. Around um, 1987, 88, I was doing maternity one night and um, I was, it was one of these grinding posteriors, heart dilating slowly up for hours. And I was in the doctor's lounge and I picked up this uh, magazine called Diagnosis. It was called an overview of ADD and uh, it wasn't called ADHD at the time. And I was reading through this article and I thought, oh my goodness, these are, I, I've missed these lectures. I haven't been to these courses. I felt very guilty in being very deficient in my knowledge on uh, pediatric childhood development. And so nobody was looking at three in the morning. So I tore the article out of this uh, magazine, which was about four months old anyway, with coffee stains on the cover and took it down to the office and Xeroxed it. And Catherine, I don't know if you know what Xerox machines are, but uh, the, uh, I Xerox these, uh, uh, this article off and it started to hand it out to parents. And I would usually get uh, parents coming back within 24 hours saying, this is my child. We really have to, to do something about it. So one of the first kids I treated um, in mission was in grade one um, and she was suspended from school. And the question being is how disruptive do you have to be uh, if you're inattentive and you're quiet and shy, you don't get suspended from school. You get suspended if you're disruptive and uh, impulsive and, uh, and, and, and also with some, some emotional dysregulation. So that's why she was suspended from school. And what was really unusual is that her father was a teacher in the school. So the teacher bent over backwards to accommodate her. So started to treat her. And within 48 hours, she's back in school doing exceptionally well. Um, uh, part of what I did when I was in mission, I worked on a child and youth mental health care team uh, through the Ministry of Children and Families. And uh, we, uh, my uh, designation on that team was with an interest in ADHD. And um, I had, I can recall a, a 10 year old um, in grade five, uh, it was May and uh, he came in w during the acute intake period. And um, uh, in fact, they were so concerned about it. They managed to get him in to see me that afternoon. And he was on the verge of being suspended from school. And so the, he wasn't going to get any counseling and support in the ministry for a couple of months because of how uh, stressed they were. So what we did is that we started him on medication. And um, he did exceptionally well. And he was named student of the month in June and completed the year without a problem. So what this really speaks to, we're doing something from a neurobiological perspective. We're normalizing as best we can brain function. And so we know that uh, ADHD is a neurobiological disorder, generally uh, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. So that's and, right. uh, Yes, and, um, and that's associated with uh, uh, anatomical changes and um, also uh, alteration in function in terms of neurochemistry with uh, decreased concentrations of neurotransmitters in those areas as well. So um, what the disorder is, it's, it's a neurobiological disorder. It's not a disorder of bad parenting. It's not a disorder of bad school system, um, and, but it's uh, found in approximately 8% of kids 6% of teens and 4% of adults. Clearly half of kids with the disorder will go on to have ADHD through, across the lifespan. And that can be um, uh, manifested in many areas, in many presentations. And we'll talk more about that uh, as the podcast goes on and also tomorrow when we talk about medication. So um, one of the things which is really interesting about the neurobiological basis of the disorder and many of those who have children with um, ADHD will understand that is the maturational lag that we see uh, with, with ADHD. In fact, kids on average are about two to three years uh, delayed as far as brain maturation is concerned. Brain maturation has got a lot to do with pruning 
And, um, and so what happens is you may ask a 14 year old to babysit, for example, but they really may only have the maturity level of a 10 or 11 year old, clearly not a smart thing to do. This also becomes really important as far as driving is concerned as well. And uh, the ability to you know, uh, function appropriately behind the wheel. And um, we talk about the core symptoms of the disorder that we see primarily related to the uh, prefrontal cortex. And those are uh, mostly working memory and attentiveness and uh, uh, just lost the picture here. There we are. Um, and uh, uh, so that's, um, th th those are the core symptoms that we see with the disorder. But what we see in about 40% of individuals with the disorder, this has a lot to do with what we call uh, um, hedonic tone, uh, the um, emotional uh, framework or setup uh, uh, connectiveness within the brain. And 40% uh, of individuals with the disorder will struggle with uh, emotional dysregulation. Okay, uh, these are the kids that have real anger management issues, hate the word no, um, and, um, and so on. And so that's a whole other area that we look at and that we try to assess when we look at individuals with a disorder. Yeah, and that's, that's a huge thing that it's understanding that a lot of these have to do with a disorder or a decreased function of executive functionings, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. that's where I know one of your sayings is pills don't equal skills. That's where we get the skill support is. And when we have that uh, support and the scaffolding for the executive functioning, because your mm -hmm. working memory is pretty much constant. You're not going to gain additional working memory by playing any games on luminosity or that sort of thing. You have what you have, yeah. but you need to learn the skills to support the deficits that you do have. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the scaffolding, the buttressing with uh, supports academically, socially, and in, in the workplace, absolutely huge. And you're right, the mantra, pills don't build skills, is really, uh, really important to understand. And also, as we were talking earlier about when we explain what the disorder is about, it's important for families to become students of the disorder and not to be victimized by it, not to be victimized by the issues of bad parenting. Is it my fault? What did I do? Uh, not to feel, um, yeah, there's a lot of judgment out there in our society, right? Uh, be it uh, academically, within families, socially, that sort of thing. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, we just have to uh, address those things and to try and diagnose um, early and manage early because what we can do is help mitigate against uh, the negative downside of uh, what we see associated with ADHD, which we can talk about later, but uh, there's a risk of not treating. And when you miss that window of opportunity, then you're opening up the uh, door for all kinds of other problems that we see with the disorder. Right, and again, there's the behavioral issues and that sort of thing that it's better to prevent them, right? You wanna yep. catch the kid before they fall off the cliff or running off the cliff, right? Right, right. You wanna have this parents in place from a young age so they don't have to have the remission or the remediation and the intensive interventions that are needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's also one other thing to, to really bring up in terms of outcome is that we, we can talk about the morbidity of the disorder, mm -hmm. okay, but it's important to understand there's a mortality associated with the disorder. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Danes in 2015 published an article about uh, uh, early mortality associated with the disorder with, uh, and if you have issues of conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, substance use disorder, your mortality rate can go up by a factor of eight, which mm -hmm. is significant. So there's a real need to um, address all the issues of ADHD early to prevent these negative outcomes as best we can. Yes, of course. So before we go further, why don't we take a minute and talk about what exactly ADHD is. Um, also mention how we've got moved from ADD to ADHD. And the three subsites, the predominantly hyperactive impulsive, primarily inattentive and the com combined presentation. Right, right. 
Um, well, it's all ADHD now, okay? And it's all ADHD, uh, primarily uh, combined type or primarily inattentive type or uh, uh, hyperactive impulsive type. About 70% of kids who present uh, will be the combined uh, type that we see with issues of uh, inattentiveness, hyperactivity and impulsivity. Uh, 20 to 25% will present only with being inattentive. These are the quiet kids who um, they don't really start to surface until after the age of 12. Part of our the criteria for diagnosis now is under the age of 12, this, having these symptoms exist for more than six months, and they must be impairing in uh, more than uh, two or more spheres of uh, function, such as at the, in the workplace, academically, socially, family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and, and those impairments, and you must have impairments, cannot be explained by, by any other mental health disorder, okay? Um, so, uh, it's, so we make this diagnosis of uh, the combined type um, it's, or whatever. It's important to establish the six months of uh, symptoms and, and then um, and rule out anything else. The, um, the other group, the hyperactive impulsive group, I rarely have made that diagnosis. Um, and that is in less than 5% of kids that present. Most of the kids I see that are hyperactive impulsive generally are inattentive. Um, and uh, may, they may not be as inattentive as, as, you know, again, all these symptoms are on a spectrum of severity, right? Um, but they all coalesce to cause a disorder and dysfunction. And that's why it's a disorder because it causes impairment and dysfunction. Um, so, but one of the things which is really important to understand with ADHD is that context changes the presentation of impairment. Context from uh, elementary to secondary to post-secondary and into the workplace. So um, because the disorder is not diagnosed before the age of 12, a lot of individuals who are primarily inattentive type, as context changes, context changes into the secondary level, uh, the impairments become more obvious with uh, problems with um, organizational skills, procrastination, the distractibility. Often the primary inattentive type is really the space cadet, the daydreamer, that kind of stuff, the issue, big issues of organization. And uh, the kids who will fall through the cracks again are those kids who are bright because they can compensate quite well. But then you go to post-secondary where it's a quantum jump in uh, demands on your time, focus, organizational skills, executive function, um, then the disorder may become more apparent at that time. And I've seen that as well. So the DSM-5 says that we, may, we have to make the, the, the diagnosis before the age of 12. However, um, the presentation of dysfunction may not appear until after that. And, but when you go back into childhood development, you'll actually see the issues of uh, inattentiveness uh, in many ways. You just have to ask the right questions. Yes, of course. And the, the other thing that I know a lot of people that, I, that I've worked with and talked to is that they're getting diagnosed when their children are getting diagnosed. Yes. So these are symptoms that, you know, it wasn't quite as common when they were kids and the, it wasn't a popular diagnosis. It wasn't something that people would consider. They say, oh, it's bad parenting. Oh, you're just bored, lazy, stupid, whatever, not trying yes. hard. And now that they're seeing these traits in their children, they're getting the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. The, the heritability of the disorder is uh, greater than that for gender, okay? It's anywhere between 60 to 90% that a parent will have, uh, that you, apples don't fall far from trees and you will find the diagnosis when you go back into family of origin. Um, if a child presents with ADHD, there's likely a more than a 50% chance that the parent will have ADHD. So I think it's really important when we see families uh, to actually screen uh, the parents to see if they have or they had ADHD um, and, uh, and as to how impairing it might be because it, it may impact uh, significantly on their ability to, to, to parent uh, and uh, to parent consistently. 
So, um, and when you need, uh, with kids, it's important to have a structure in the home. And if you've got a parent that can't provide structure, then that, be, that sort of uh, influences the scaffolding and uh, buttressing that we see that we need to have uh, in management of the disorder across the lifespan. Yeah, and as you were saying, like it's hard to, if you have ADHD and your child has ADHD and your, your profiles are similar for your strengths and weaknesses, you can't provide support in something that you're struggling with yourself. Right, right, yeah, yeah. And what the, the other thing um, about a parent as well, and uh, for parents that are listening, um, that uh, one of the things that we see with the disorder, um, as you age and you get into various stages of development, you see this disorder undergoes what I call a metamorphosis, okay? Where certain things start to happen, where you see the disorder, um, complicated by uh, mood and anxiety issues, uh, substance use issues, et cetera, et cetera. So where I often see uh, undiagnosed ADHD is with a, an adult presenting with a depression, okay? And particularly a, a treatment resistant depression. And, uh, and then you may add a, a psychostimulant to their antidepressant treatment and it's dramatic and uh, it is dramatic, uh, the response. So um, yeah, uh, so th what the, we, the parent may write off is why they're having difficulties may be the mood disorder, but embedded in that may be undiagnosed ADHD. So I think it's an important place to go there. The adult self-reporting rating scale that we use takes about a minute to complete their two parts, part A and part B, four to six in part A and seven out of 12 in part B will give you uh, the suspicion of the diagnosis um, and, uh, and it's to a certain degree, the severity. Uh, it has a sensitivity of about 90%, which is I think very good, uh, but it will help support you in making that diagnosis. But the most important thing, when we try to make the diagnosis and understand the neurobiology of the diagnosis and the, and the impairments associated with that is the narrative that we have with, with our patient, our ability to hear their story because their story is unique to the individual. Mm -hmm. So I often uh, will get these rating scales and these tools that we use. And then I'll ask them to tell me about your PDF file. And everybody's got a personal documents file, but the PDF file with ADHD is procrastination, distractibility, and forgetfulness. And if you want to understand the challenges on a daily basis with a, an individual with ADHD, get them to talk about their PDF file, procrastination, distractibility, and forgetfulness. Definitely an important thing to consider. And with a term like that, is there a, a catchy name like that? It's a little bit easier to remember for those. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then one thing that I wanted to ask, I know I've spoken to some adults who, when bringing this up with their physicians, are like, oh, well, you know, you're doing so well, it doesn't matter, even if you have ADHD. And I think, can you, can you speak to that and how to you know, if you're having someone tell you that, well, you're successful enough, so it's not something we need you to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that. um, yeah, that's that's a big problem, particularly when ADHD is not rooted in IQ. Okay, and uh, so you have a number of individuals who can be quite bright, but will uh, obviously be an underachiever because they can't sort of function maximally, uh, and uh, they may, uh, uh, if, they're, if they are interested in something, they can have the ability to focus and overfocus. But if the individual is not interested in whatever they're doing, uh, they become bored very easily. Okay, and so the um, even though you're bright, uh, remember, forty percent of individuals um, have issues with um, emotional dysregulation, right? So that can be hugely impairing with relationships. Um, so the um, inattentiveness is only one of the core symptoms. We also have issues of impulsivity as well, and in individuals who are impulsive, they know what to do they just don't know when to do it okay and uh be careful of uh those individuals kids that present who don't know what to do and don't know when to do it because that's when you're talking about kids on the spectrum and uh and so um impulsivity can be very impairing and uh particularly when it can morph into as you get older issues of addiction um, and numerous forms of addiction, be it substance, alcohol, sexual, spending, et cetera, et cetera, gambling. Um, that's all part of ADHD. 
Um, and the other thing that I think is why it's so important to diagnose early is the impact on uh, personality development. And um, uh, the, the biggest thing that we see with uh, a lot of kids with a disorder is that as they're not successful in school, self-esteem becomes a big problem. They start to say, I can't rather than I can. And they, then they start to uh, marginalize themselves as well. And that becomes really, really hard with kids. So I think we have to address all these things early, treat early to avoid these negative outcomes. Yeah. Um, and again, with the, the comorbidity aspect, I mean, there are two things that are commonly co-occurring with ADHD in the younger student age, yep. right? You have the kids with autism that also have ADHD, and then you have the kids with learning disabilities that often yep. have ADHD, yep. and they can mask the other diagnoses sure. um, in, in the literature, or, you know, in pop knowledge there's been always oh yeah well kids are misdiagnosed with a learning disability when they actually have adhd or kids with adhd are diagnosed instead of having a learning disability um, and even in autism oh they don't look for that next diagnosis so how is important is it to make sure that we take that whole picture to make sure that we're not missing the diagnosis. Well, I think that uh, let's uh, deal with uh, the issue of um, uh, a learning disability, okay? And comorbidity, okay? We know that 40% of uh, individuals who present with uh, ADHD have a learning disability. Uh, ADHD is a problem of executive function. A learning disability is a problem of secretarial function, okay? How you read, write, and express yourself, if you like, in mathematical skill sets as well. Um, so when you start to see, um, when you start treating uh, ADHD and you still see significant academic delay, then that's when I would start to say, you know, that's time for psychoed, okay, in that situation. Do all kids with a, presenting with ADHD need a psychoed? Definitely not, okay? It's not part of the, how we make the diagnosis. Um, Again, uh, with autism, many of the kids I've seen in practice will present um, uh, the autistic kids who are uh, emotionally dysregulated, inattentive, uh, hard to sit still in story time in kindergarten, grade one is a challenge, um, present ADHD-like, but once they uh, persist through early elementary school, you start to realize there's more of a problem here. Uh, certainly the kids that are, uh, that are significantly on the spectrum, you're going to pick up early, right? So you'll pick up uh, as toddlers. Uh, but uh, the kids that are um, uh, with what we call Asperger's in the past, uh, mm -hmm. they will uh, present later. Um, they also, uh, about 5 to 10% of them, a bit more, may have ADHD and will respond to a psychostimulant. And I've had a number of kids with the, uh, on the spectrum who have been on psychostimulants for their ADHD component comorbidity with their uh, 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 being on the spectrum. Yeah. Well, and then one, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. William Dodson's quote that it's estimated by the age of 12, children who have ADHD receive 20,000 more negative messages from parents, teachers, and other adults than their friends and siblings who do not have ADHD. Yeah. And I think this quote really draws into that attention where we, where you we were talking about the mental health issues that come along sure. with it and the negative self-talk. Uh, and, you know, when you're hearing try harder, you're lazy all the time, mm -hmm. when people don't realize that you actually are trying your hardest. Yeah. 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 It's difficult. And then you want to give up. They're like, well, what's the point of trying hard? If when I put all my effort into this, people this still say I'm not trying. Yeah. 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 Very much so. And I think that uh, um, the, that's, and that brings up the question well, um, should we only treat uh, uh, Johnny on school days? Right. Uh, not realizing the fact that, you know, you take your ADHD brain to the playground, you take it to act after school activities, you take it home with you, all that kind of stuff. So the dysfunction is in, in just not academically as elsewhere, more mm -hmm. subtly, but maybe. But the, the important thing is that the individual is controlled seven days a week. OK, and um, and one of the saddest things I think I've seen with ADHD in my years of practice is the uh, the birthday party phenomenon. And that's where if you have a kid who is hyperactive, impulsive, like uh, jumping on the furniture, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, really spinning their wheels with the cake and ice cream and the Tracy bag and all that kind of stuff, that kid's not going to get invited back you know, uh, or invited you know, to other parties. I've, I've seen that. And that's where uh, that marginalization component and self-esteem is a, a big issue. So I think that uh, what I like now is a gen what I see now is that uh, when you have a birthday party, um, all the kids in the class are invited, which I think is a good thing too. I think it helps overcome a lot of that uh, discrimination, which I think is, you know, a good thing. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, now, why don't we take a, a bit to talk about some of the different comorbid issues. Um, right. I want to start off with ADHD and people who struggle with sleep. Yeah, yeah, over 50% of individuals with ADHD will, have, will present with a sleep uh, problem. And uh, what is interesting is that many of them will have the busy brain when, the time, when it's time to go to bed. And uh, there's a small number, not my experience is not the majority, but a small number will respond to a psychostimulant. Uh, rather than keeping them awake, it'll help quiet the busy brain, which will allow them to sleep, which is a, a good thing. But so um, again, um, uh, with sleep problems, the sleep ritual is absolutely huge. Um, I think that you should avoid screen time before bedtime by at least an hour. Um, you should have, you know, bath time, story time. Uh, it should be a strategy of de-escalation. Um, and, uh, and for those kids who really are having a lot of difficulty, it's worth trying melatonin and you can dose up to 10 milligrams, uh, which is pretty high 10, but most kids you start off with somewhere between, um, three to five. Um, and, uh, that can be helpful. Uh, some of the kids are just so cortically activated that you end up using other types of medications to help deal with that. We use one that's called clonidine. We used to use a lot of, but uh, in the past, which is sedating. And, uh, and that's been a strategy. Um, yeah, there's a, a number of things that you can do. But I think the most important thing that gets back to um, the, the importance of habituating routine um, and uh, de-escalating as far as stimulation is concerned around bedtime. Um, I think the, um, yeah, and, and not have noise distracting, a TV on, that kind of stuff, music, uh, it should be just a quiet time and, um, and it should be um, something which is done every night. Again, I get into uh, with behavioral therapy, right? How many, it's, how many times do you have to do something before it becomes a habit? Any idea? Depends on the person. <laughs> <laughs> Twice for some. Uh, the magic number is 21. 21. Hit 21, yeah. So what you have to do before you bail on what your strategy is, you're gonna do it for at least three weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, three weeks to a month. So I think it's important that uh, when you, as a parent, it's important that you really have to talk to your spouse, partner, whatever, to really respect the rules of, of de-escalation, of quiet mm -hmm. time, that kind of stuff. And I think if you can do that and make actually make bedtime a fun time too, you know, where you can look forward to the stories, you can look, it's a chance to engage. It's because it's really for a more form of active parenting, you know, passive parenting is within front of a screen, right? But this is active parenting. And I think this is a way of actually, uh, where that works out is that I think it pays dividends when you, when the kids get to be into their teens, where you can actually, it teaches you how to have a conversation with them. And so I think that's, uh, there are lots of, um, I think, um, interesting values in that. So, yeah, so I would, routine is really important to sleep for sure. Right. Now, what about some of those other comorbidities like ODD, oppositional defiance disorder? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's, um, again, that's often related to um, the kids that are, that have the struggle with the emotional dysregulation, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so when we look at, for oppositional defiant disorder, we like to use the tool called the SNAP 426. So that uh, consists of 26 questions. The first 18 questions are for ADHD. Questions one to nine are for the symptoms of, core symptoms of inattentiveness. Uh, questions 10 to 18 are for the core symptoms of hyperactive impulsive behaviors, symptoms. 
Um, and then questions uh, 19 to 26 are for oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, you need to have six out of nine being positive in, for inattentiveness and six out of nine being positive for hyperactive impulsive and four out of eight being positive for um, uh, oppositional defiant disorder. Now, what we often find is with treatment is that we, uh, with AD, for ADHD, we see often an, an extinguishing of the ODD with treatment for ADHD. There's often no drug for ADHD, okay? But some of these kids are uh, very oppositional and very mood dysregulated. And so there's another group of kids that we call, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it, uh, DMDD, uh, is it uh, dysfunctional mood dysregulation disorder? Is that yeah. What it is? Yeah. And um, so you have to look at for these kids that may be DMDD. These kids are at risk for substance abuse in, the, uh, in adolescence. Why it's important to get a handle on ODD is that we know untreated ADHD. Uh, there's about a 40% uh, chance by the age of 15 untreated, the child will be struggling with issues of alcohol and substances. And um, the ODD is a way, it acts as kind of like a, a, a catalyst towards that. So um, uh, that, that's a marker that should be identified and uh, watched carefully. Definitely. And, you know, I think that the reason why they turn to the, the drugs and the alcohol is self-medication, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're able to, the calm down and the peace that they get when they've had that substance yeah gives yeah, them, that's, that's part of it gives yeah. them the break yeah. that they can't yeah. have otherwise yeah yeah and then there's the group that's just simply um uh you know they just like getting high you know like getting drunk and all that kind of stuff but moreover um getting drunk will not cause long-term brain cognitive issues okay getting high will and using uh, smoking marijuana uh, in your in late adolescence into early adulthood we know that uh, not even chronic daily use uh, one joint or less a day can uh, end up with permanent cognitive deficits uh, as much as much as uh, quoted uh, eight IQ points and uh, which is permanent you don't recover from that can be a, a significant thing. So one of the things about smoking dope and, it, and you it gets out to be counseled is that it's, it significantly dumb, dumbs you down. It dumbs you down. That's what I talk to kids about. And, and that dumbing down process may persist into adulthood. And, uh, and that's serious. It's very serious. Definitely. Definitely. Now we also have things like uh, reactive attachment disorder or RAD. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, they can be separate or it can be, can be part yeah. of the ADHD. Yeah. Do you have yeah. thoughts on that? Uh, I don't really get into that a whole lot. I'll actually refer because those kids are uh, are pretty dysfunctional and right. those fa uh, family groups can be pretty dysfunctional. So my interest is in the arena of primary care. So right. when I see that or I suspect that, then I would like to have them see a developmental pediatrician. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, or get involved in child and youth mental health because right. what you need is really focused parenting uh, uh, interventions as well. Right. And so um, the, other, the other thing that you have to worry about are these, uh, uh, is like some of these adjustment issues, but is the whole issue of what we call borderline traits right. and issues of self harm, yes. uh, which is a real big problem. And yeah. so, um, and that may be a prodrome to what we call borderline personality disorder. So, yeah. but the important thing is to always ask about borderline traits of, of cutting uh, in particular and, uh, and get these uh, families in for dialect, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Yeah. Absolutely crucial. And the other thing that we have to address, particularly today uh, in the adolescent population, is vaping. Yes. Vaping, vaping is a big issue. It's a huge issue. And uh, when I, I've often, had, some of the responses I get from kids that tell me about vaping and uh, who's doing it. And the response has been with a number of kids, well, well, who's not sort of, sort of thing. So, um, you know, these are conversations you just have to have with kids today and find out what they're doing. And, you know, if they're starting to vape with, um, psychoactive meds, I mean, it's, or not meds with substances, it's, uh, yeah, problematic. Definitely. Um, and then there's also things like OCD and um, 
eating disorders that come into play as well. And it's that area that the kids are able to hyper focus on and take control. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, comorbidity with, uh, first of all, it does deal with the anxiety disorders. So the, yeah, often these kids present with, there's an OCD component, but mostly it's generalized anxiety disorder and panic. And that often may go along with a, a mood disorder as well. Um, so yeah, it's important to, uh, that should be on the radar. We, in primary care, we have tools uh, for um, uh, anxiety disorder and mood disorders in kids. And, um, and so I think it's important to uh, just always be aware of that. Um, yeah, so it's uh, eating disorders, eating, dysfunctional eating is really interesting uh, with ADHD. Uh, obesity is found in about 40 to 50% of adults with the disorder. About 20% of adults will have what we call binge eating disorder, which again is a, a, it's a psychiatric disorder. It's not an, an eating disorder that we see with uh, anorexia nervosa or bulimia, uh, but it is very responsive to appropriate medication. Uh, but um, uh, disinhibited eating um, uh, is uh, a problem. And particularly, as you say, some kids would uh, self-medicate with substances. A lot of kids often will self-medicate with junk food sort of thing. So I think it's important to another thing to address uh, because you start to look at the global health issues, uh, be it uh, the impact of obesity in adulthood, diabetes, hypertension, uh, premature cardiovascular disease, all problematic. And then there's also the other issues that we have to deal with, with obesity. So, um, so I think it's important to get down to, when you, whenever we see somebody presenting, I think it's important to ask what else is going on here? What is going on with this metamorphosis that we see with the presentation, be it medical or psychiatric uh, with the impairments by working backwards? Uh, it's amazing what you'll find. Definitely. Yeah. Now we've, we've talked about this hyper focus kind of in reference to some of our conversations. Let's go into that. Like, let's dig deep into what it means because you see these kids with ADHD, but they're able to hyper focus on that one activity that they love. Yeah. Well, how come I can't have ADHD when they can play games for like four hours, right? I mean, how, I mean, that's, I can't even play it for 10 minutes. I mean, uh, I've got ADHD if I can't play a game for 10 minutes, but look at, they can, they can do it for like four hours. And this brings up another big issue with screen time in kids with the disorder. And, um, and there's one other thing I just want to get up, get, talk about regarding the, the neurobiology of the disorder, which is just coming out now with COVID. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so kids, if something is interesting, they will hyper-focus. And often it's usually electronic or digital, but when it comes to uh, other things that are, there, there's no interest, boredom is the, it's like a near death experience. They just, I mean, if they, if, if they're bored, they're going to move or they're going to make something else move, but they're not going to sit there and do nothing. Okay. And uh, so that, and that ha really reflects, uh, well, it uh, helps us strategize in terms of educational plans. Kids with the disorder respond to structure and motivation and novelty. So you have to make learning fun. You have to make what they do interesting. And, um, and th that can be really hard. And, and but you have to have this relationship with the, the school, right? And, uh, and you have to maximize treatment for, you know, what else is going on if it's ADHD, but also the kids who are ADHD and with learning disability. Okay, these kids really struggle. Okay, this is these are disorders of, of executive as well as secretarial function. And these are the kids that really truly need to be in a special learning environment without question. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a real problem. I, I talked about COVID. Shall I talk about that now? Because Definitely. we're, we're in a really, really good. yeah, we're in a really interesting period now. I was actually uh, listening to Dr. McIntyre, who's probably one of the most foremost Canadian researchers on the weekend, uh, doing a webinar. Um, there's, uh, they're talking now about the long haul with COVID. I mean, COVID's only been around in North America for what uh, ten months now. Yeah. That. Okay. So what they're finding are there are some executive function cognitive sequelae to COVID, okay? The virus is found to have a great affinity towards the uh, central nervous system, okay? And it's now, uh, as, as well as 
that. And then what happens is it can stimulate a significant immune response, right? You talk about the cytokine storm that they've talked about with COVID and just the inflammatory response also has an impact on cognitive function and it has this definitely has central nervous uh, uh, system effects. Um, the, uh, and also sometimes some of the medications, well, you, know, you saw what dexamethasone did to Donald Trump, right? So, um, uh, but, so that not everybody gets that. But the, the big issue is the, the impact of the virus and the cytokine, cytokine storm that it has on um, uh, individuals who present ADHD-like they present with frontal lobe impairments. And, uh, and so when you start to screen them for ADHD, they come out looking like ADHD. So this is a, a whole new conversation that we're having now in uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary care. We're going to learn more and more about this, but there is the long haul challenge that we have with COVID. And uh, a year from now, it'll be interesting to see how we're talking about this. Uh, diagnosing it and managing it. Well, yeah, because if if the the COVID's causing this, then they wouldn't fit the DSM criteria. That's right. The ADHD, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the uh, but you start when you start to look at the neurobiological neurochemical impairments that we see with the disorder. Uh, yeah. It's almost like sometimes like a traumatic brain injury with frontal lobe trauma that, mm -hmm. uh, that you present ADHD like. And, uh, and so when you see individuals presenting in the fog, for example, post COVID, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you start to look at the metrics of ADHD, you know, they're there. And so uh, and these individuals, uh, after they recovered, they looked like they've recovered physically, but cognitively, as far as executive function is concerned, they may not have. So when they have to go back into, let's say if it's academically or into the workplace, and this may also be something to consider with kids as well, because they, uh, they generate a, a very large, huge immune response to viruses mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's, um, you know, it's just really interesting right now. And I think the fact that we're at least recognizing things, we're asking questions, and uh, we're going to start to formalize our assessment tools and just, um, you know, um, just uh, expand our radar screen, if you like, to see what we're seeing with uh, presenting later on, um, in both in uh, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Yeah, definitely. Now we're kind of winding down, but I want to end kind of more positively because there's lots of people who have ADHD and are able to succeed. So what are yeah. these things that we can do to help people with ADHD succeed? What, what can we do to scaffold the support, help them find those things that they love? So, you know, when they're done school and they're done that phase that's really not designed for them, they can excel. Yeah, well, you know, the, the thing about ADHD, which I think is a really good thing, is that you're, it's not that the brain is not doing anything. The brain is very active. It's thinking about other things as well. Uh, it, the brain can be very creative, right? And, and so you've heard certain notables in our, our society, you know, they've got ADHD, but they've been very <clears throat> successful. They've been very su successful because of basically three things. One is that they're somewhat intelligent, but you don't always have to be really up there high in the IQ scale. Uh, but they've been risk takers, right? Uh, but they've been very creative because they've been thinking of things and they, and that creativity and, and combined with risk, it, you know, it can really uh, be a good thing. So when we treat you with ADHD, it's not that we're, we want to um, sort of uh, uh, eliminate that. We don't want to change who you are. It's interesting when you treat kids with ADHD, you know, um, they'll, you'll treat them and they'll come in and uh, uh, so they'll, you'll ask the child and the parent is in the room. Uh, so you've been on treatment for, for like two weeks. Uh, have you noticed anything? No. Uh, has it changed you? No. And, uh, and the parent is there, the eyes are rolling and they're saying, what? What, <laughs> what about this? What about that? Oh yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, so they, it's, they're not really, when we're treating ADHD, it's important not to elim eliminate that creativity. It's not, we don't want to eliminate that spark that an individual has. We don't want to change them. All that we want to do is control the PDF file. 
So they're not procrastinating, procrastinating, they're not distractible, and they're not forgetting to do things, okay? And so what you find is that you actually enhance that creativity, that output, that productivity, improve executive function. So in fact, um, uh, everything just gets better, if you like. Yeah, and that's that's great because you can have success with the right support. And oh. there, there's no reason why you shouldn't have the same expectations as anyone else, as long as you have that support in place. Yeah, the biggest problem we have, one of the things I see, and I see, I've treated quite a few professionals with ADHD, uh, be it lawyers, accountants, physicians, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And um, often they, they are uh, qu quite bright, but what has been um, clear is that they've always been underachievers uh, academically. Uh, but the problem that you get is that, you know, as you, as you move through the lifespan and context changes and demands change, then impairments start, right? And so um, uh, it's, yeah, so the, the, what was, uh, you were functional at one part of your life, now you're not. And, and that can be very upsetting. And particularly when you, when you know you can do better, and so uh, we we've really you know we can help all those individuals for sure. Definitely, yeah. and as we're talking about tomorrow, medication is an option to help provide support, but it's not the only solution, right? You need to have more than one strategy to support. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll talk about medication and why medication is so important. And uh, we use uh, uh, medication, I would argue, uh, for uh, how do you define the severity of ADHD, mild, moderate, and severe? And I think that you should be, anybody with a diagnosis should have a trial of medication. Um, and uh, But what goes along with presentations is co comorbidity. And so we'll talk more, more about comorbidity and medications that we use in addition to, uh, let's say, a psychostimulant dealing with mood, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there, you know, the disorder is unique to the individual, okay? Um, there is um, not really a set recipe for everybody, but you have to really personalize treatment and, and also recognize the challenges that we see in families as well. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I think the most important thing is to, it's to recognize that it is unique to the individual and, and recognize that uniqueness in everybody that we see. Right. So what would your advice be to someone that thinks that they have ADHD or their child or loved one has it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things you can do is actually um, uh, read as much as, as you can. I would go to the website Kadak, C A D D A C dot C A. Kadak is uh, an organization that advocates for parents and individuals with the disorder. So Kadak is is the, the one thing. If you go online, I would go to Kadak and, and do that. We have rating scales, and the the one that we use in primary care all the time for kids and teens is a SNAP 426, which will give you ADHD and um, oppositional defiant disorder. It's divine, designed for both the parents and teacher. Um, and uh, it, most of the time you get an accurate assessment, but sometimes teachers feel threatened and they will sanitize the uh, SNAP 426, thinking that it reflects their teaching ability. And so you, uh, you will, so the, what's important in that situation, the narrative, the history is so, is so key. Um, in um, adults and uh, uh, older teens, we use the uh, um, ASRS, the Adult Self-Reporting Rating Scale, and that is very good too. Uh, so those are screeners. And so you can um, take those screeners if you like, they don't take very long to fill out and go to your family doctor. But the most important thing is to actually uh, present and talking about your impairments, okay? Um, and so uh, in order to make the diagnosis, we have to talk, you know, that has to be backgrounded by that narrative of, of an impairing diagnosis. And so if you can do that and have it kind of put together in your, you can even write things down and say, look, you know, this is where it's at. Because when we make the diagnosis of ADHD, we want to look at three things. I tell parents this all the time. Are you the ADHD duck? Okay. Uh, if you quack like a duck, are you a duck? Maybe, okay. Uh, if you walk like a duck and quack like a duck, are you a duck? 
Well, the DSM-5 says that you are a duck, okay? And if you look like a duck, walk like a duck, and quack like a duck, you're sure as heck not a turkey, okay? So what does all that mean, okay? Looking like a duck, okay, is family history. We know that 60 to 90% of individuals with the disorder inherit the disorder, okay? But that's not part of the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. So what we look at when an individual comes into our office is the cross-sectional history being quacking like a duck. So not every, if you're quacking like a duck, you may have a significant PDF file, okay? Uh, but other things can cause it too, like an anxiety disorder, depression, a number of things. So, uh, but at least uh, you're in the game by saying, okay, uh, it sounds like it's ADHD. The, the screening tools that we're using, the SRS and the SNAP 426 will tell us that you're quacking like a duck. But what we have to do is make sure that you walk like a duck through the lifespan, that you've actually been uh, experiencing these symptoms of impairment with uh, the, you know, the, the outcomes of impairment with these ADHD symptoms uh, for more than six months, not explained by any other psychiatric disorder. So uh, that's what I mean by walking like a duck is the metamorphosis of the disorder through childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood, no matter where you are throughout the lifespan. So um, I think it's important that when you go in and see your family doctor, doctor uh, and have them entertain this diagnosis to say, look, I think I am a duck here. I, I'm quacking like a duck and this is what's happening in my life right now. But I've walked like a duck from childhood into adolescence into adulthood. And that's what we look for in making the diagnosis. But the clincher is, you know what? I really look like a duck, okay? Because my father was a duck for sure. And, uh, or my, you know, my brother was a duck or, you know, and that type of thing. So actually when, when I use the, the duck uh, analogy, patients really get it. And it's and with no disrespect towards ducks, okay? And no disrespect towards the patient because they don't, you don't have the big beak, but uh, you know, and uh, but that's the, they they get it, okay? They just really get it.